Hello, my name's Chris. In this podcast and subsequent podcasts, you'll join me and my conversation partner, Adrian, as we read through and discuss the book Miracles by C.S. Lewis. We have no credentials or titles and have no reason to pretend any authority on these serious matters. We presume to record these talks because they've helped us in the past and think they might be useful to others. If you would like to get the most out of these talks, we recommend having a copy of Miracles you can read along with. We appreciate you joining us. These are just conversations. You ready? Yeah. Let's okay. get to it. Miracles by C.S. Lewis. Okay, the book starts with a poem. Um, I've read this poem a lot, and it does, uh, I feel like it summarizes the book. Um, I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, Among the hills, a meteorite lies huge, and moss has overgrown, and wind and rain with touches light made soft the contours of the stone. Thus easily can earth digest a cinder of sidereal fire, and make her translunary guest the native of an English shire. Nor is it strange these wanderers find in her lap their fitting place, for every particle that's hers came at the first from outer space. All that is earth has once been the sky, down from the sun of old she came, or from some star that traveled by too close to his entangling flame. Hence, if belated drops yet fall from heaven, on these her plastic power still works as once it worked on all, the glad rush of the golden shower. So this poem is about the earth's ability to to absorb uh, what comes from um, from outer space, right? Meteorites that happen to be traveling by that are now part of Earth as much as any rock is. Mm. Um, they, um, the first stanza there talks about um, a meteorite that is now covered in moss and uh, its edges are rubbed off and made smooth by by time and weather and um, uh, um, contact with other things. And it's now as much a part of some English garden or some some um, place in England as anything now. else is. Say again. It's part of the landscape. It's now. part of the landscape, right? And, and gotcha. um, so Earth has absorbed it uh, and and made it a part of itself, and it's not even noticed anymore in that sense. And this is a pretty good correlate or a pretty good analog for uh, Lewis's argument for miracles in this book um, that they that they uh, come from outside of the natural processes. And of course, meteorites are part of the natural processes in the larger sense, but he's using that as an analog for, for uh, um, his argument about miracles, that they come from the outside but are absorbed by nature itself, um, that they are made part of its landscape, and so they escape our notice. Hmm. Uh, just one quick question. Is this word here... Is it sidereal? Sidereal. Sidereal. Mm -hmm. The cinder of sidereal fire. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Sidereal. Okay, so sidereal is uh, um, is referring to the uh, the uh, the fire or the uh, the um, 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 sun like star like. Uh, flame that burns out in space okay okay and of course that the, the other word in the second stanza there the word that's what the word you're talking about it says thus easily can earth digest a cinder of sidereal fire and make her translunary guess the native of an english shire translunary obviously meaning something that comes from beyond the orbit of the moon lunary translunary beyond mm. the moon okay okay great okay so yes the first chapter sense. here is called The Scope of This Book, and it begins like many of these, uh, like all of these chapters do, with a quote, and this one's by Aristotle from um, his book Metaphysics. Uh, the quote is, those who wish to succeed must ask the right preliminary questions. So we have to ask the right questions, the right beginning questions, in order to even be, ha have a reasonable and uh, meaningful discussion about whatever it is we're discussing. Um <laughs> This quote kind of reminds me of uh, of uh, something Jordan Peterson will often say when people ask him 
if he believes in God, he'll say, well, what do you mean by God? Uh, or, um, or he'll even say, what do you mean by believe? Mm -hmm. You know, he's trying to, I think he, in his way, is trying to do what Aristotle here is recommending, that you have to ask the right preliminary questions, right beginning questions. So I'll just start reading here. In all my life, I have met only one person who claims to have seen a ghost. And the interesting thing about the story is that that person believed in the immortal soul, uh, excuse me, is that that person disbelieved in the immortal soul before she saw the ghost and still disbelieves after seeing it. She says that what she saw must have been an illusion or a trick of the nerves, and obviously she may be right. Seeing is not believing. For this reason, the question whether miracles occur can never be answered simply by experience. Every event, which might claim to be a miracle, is, in the last resort, something presented to our senses, something seen, heard, touched, smelled, or tasted. And our senses are not infallible. If anything extraordinary seems to have happened, we can't always say that we have been the victims of an illusion. If we hold a philosophy which excludes the supernatural, this is what we always shall say. What we learn from experience depends on the kind of philosophy we bring to experience. It is therefore useless to appeal to experience before we have settled as well as we can the philosophical question. Of course, this is an illustration or uh, an expounding of the, the quote that starts the chapter. We have to ask the right preliminary questions. He gives an example of a woman who's seen a ghost uh, the only person he has ever met who says that they've seen a ghost, and this person doesn't believe in the immor in the immortal soul. Uh, those seem like those seem like inconsistent positions. Yeah. How can you believe you've seen a ghost when you don't believe in the immortal soul? What is a ghost uh, if it's not an immortal soul? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, um, you know, he says this. This is a story that kind of makes it clear that we have to analyze what are our initial positions when we go into discussing this this subject if if uh, we are if we maintain a philosophy that excludes the supernatural then our um our uh, our verdict about any event being a miracle or not being a mir being a miracle will right from the beginning be well it wasn't a miracle hmm. uh, if you hold that that of course there's no supernatural events then right at the beginning you're going to say well Whatever it, it was, it, it wasn't, wasn't a, a miracle. Ghost. It, and yeah. whatever it was, it wasn't a ghost. You're going to have to go into it thinking. Uh, you're, you're, so the discussion doesn't start out with a discussion about miracles. It starts out with a discussion about how we see things. Mm. <clears throat> that's, that's uh, of course, that's the last, uh, the last sentence there in that paragraph. It, it is therefore useless to appeal to experience before we have settled as well as we can the philosophical question. If immediate experience cannot prove or disprove the miraculous, still less can history do so. So um, our, our experiences are tainted by fallibility, uh, error. Uh, you see things that aren't uh, accurate. You hear things that are off. Um, so uh, an appeal to your experience or to my experience is an appeal to a story with errors in it. Um, so is history. Many people think one can decide whether a miracle occurred in the past by examining the evidence, quote, according to the ordinary rules of historical inquiry, end quote. But the ordinary rules cannot be worked, uh, excuse me, but the ordinary rules cannot be worked until we have decided whether miracles are possible, and if so, how probable they are. For if they are impossible, then no amount of historical evidence will convince us. There again, we're talking about our, our, uh, preconceived notions before we enter in on the discussion. Um, what are our uh, um, um, what are our beliefs about this subject before we even start talking about it? If they are impossible, miracles. If miracles are impossible but immensely improbable, then only mathematically demonstrative evidence will convince us. And since history never provides that degree of evidence for any event, history can never convince us that a miracle occurred. Uh, so. You know, if we had enough evidence, enough numbers poured in, we could uh, analyze them in a table and say how probable or how improbable they are. Maybe they are just, maybe they might happen, but they're immensely improbable, um, uh, like being struck by lightning. 
Like it is possible to be struck by lightning, but the possibility that you will go through your whole life and never be struck by lightning and never see someone who who has been struck by lightning is extremely high. Very unlikely you'll ever meet anybody. Uh, but we know this because we can examine the experiences of a bunch of people in a study and mathematically analyze what the possibility might or might not be. You can't do that with historical evidence because there's never enough evidence in the historical record to do so. Uh, if, on the other hand, miracles are not intrinsically improbable, then the existing evidence will be sufficient to convince us that quite a number of miracles have occurred. Uh, so we have to decide at the start, are miracles possible or are they impossible? This is what he's talking about. Uh, if they're intrinsically impossible, then uh, we're never going to see enough evidence in history because we know at the outset that they can't happen. If they're intrinsically possible, history also won't convince us, uh, isn't much help, I should say, because there's lots of stories of miracles in history. Mm. Many of them are probably false, though, or just errors. They may be outright lies, and some of them may just be wrong, incorrect, uh, mistaken. Right. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say that uh, the football play they saw was a miracle or that the fact that they avoided a car wreck earlier that week was a miracle when it may just it may more <laughs> here. I'm using statistics again. It may more likely have just been how things worked out. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. The result of our historical inquiries thus depends on the philosophical views which we have been holding before we even begin, excuse, excuse me, before we even began to look at the evidence. This philosophical question must therefore come first. Here is an example of the sort of thing that happens if we omit the preliminary philosophical task and rush on to the historical. So if we don't handle the philosophical question first, if we don't handle our, our uh, preconceptions first and just rush in to say, well, uh, what about this particular miracle? What about that particular miracle in the record of history? Uh, there's an error that's going to occur there, and he's about to talk about it. In a popular commentary on the Bible, you will find a discussion of the date at which the fourth gospel was written. So there's some commentary he's talking about, and they're talking about when was the gospel of John written. That's the fourth gospel. Um, and uh, the author comes at it this way. The author says it must have been written after the execution of St. Peter, because in the fourth gospel, Christ is represented as predicting the execution of St. Peter. <clears throat> now, why would he say that? Why would the author say, well, the, the date when the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, was written must have happened after the death of St. Peter, because St. Peter was executed. Uh, why must it have happened then? Because, well, he's seeing in the gospel of John that Christ predicts, he says Peter will die. Mm at some point. He predicts it. He's assuming that there's no way Christ could have known that prior to it happening. So John wrote it in, in the words of Christ, using the words of Christ, putting those words into the mouth of Christ after the fact. He uh, uh, heard of Peter dying, he knew the story of Peter dying, and he wrote it into his gospel after the fact. Christ didn't predict it. John wrote it back into Christ's words um, after the fact. Mm -hmm. So this author, obviously, at the outset is assuming the miraculous, the supernatural, doesn't occur. Because Christ can't predict things, right? That's the assumption he's coming at it with. Christ can't predict things, so in order for Christ to have predicted this, it would, uh, it would have to have been John uh, writing back into history the event that Christ couldn't have known about before it occurred. You understand? Mm -hmm. A book, thinks the author, getting back to C.S. Lewis here, uh, quote, a book, end quote, thinks the author, quote, cannot be written before events which it refers to, end quote. Of course it cannot, unless real predictions ever occur. If they do, then this argument for the date is in ruins. And the author has not discussed at all whether real predictions are possible. So the author just assumes predictions are not possible. Mm. 
he takes it for granted, perhaps unconsciously, that they are not, that they are not possible. Perhaps he is right, but if he is, he has not discovered this principle by historical inquiry. He has brought his disbelief in predictions to his, his, to his historical work, so to speak, ready-made. He has brought his disbelief in predictions to his historical work, so to speak, ready-made. Unless he had done so, his historical conclusion about the date of the fourth gospel could not have been reached at all. His work is therefore quite useless to a person who wants to know whether predictions occur. The author gets to work only after he has already answered that question in the negative, and on grounds which he never communicates to us. So he assumes before uh, before entering in the subject that predictions can occur. In other words, he excludes the possibility of the supernatural. It's, uh, it's a priori for him. A priori meaning at the uh, before any. It's an, it's an, he's making an assumption about the discussion he's talking about. He's approaching it a priori. And he never communicates this to us. He never tells us by, wh by what means he came to this conclusion that the supernatural is excluded. And he gets to work on his subject um, from that point. Um, and so Lewis says, well, this, this is, of course, this uh, uh, conclusion about when the Gospel of John must have been written is useless to us because... If we want to, um, if we want to know how he came to exclude the supernatural from his considerations, right? When he was considering when the Gospel of John was written, he said, "Well, it must have been written after Peter was executed, because Christ predicts that in the Gospel, uh, or John has Christ predicted in the Gospel." That's the way he would say it. John has Christ predict the Gospel because he wrote those words into Christ's mouth. Um, but that that doesn't help us at all if we're interested um, uh, in whether or not predictions can occur. He has already decided they cannot. We might be interested in whether they can. And he doesn't communicate to us how he came to that conclusion. Uh, he's just making he's he's starting so he's starting from that point. In we the discussion. being someone who um, believes that miracles can occur. Well, or? no, we don't necessarily have to believe that miracles can occur. We can we can just be wondering if they do. He's already decided that fact for himself and written his conclusions about when the uh, the date the Gospel of John was written based on that. Okay. This book, Lewis, uh, Lewis continues, this book is intended as a preliminary to historical inquiry. In other words, it's something we would read before historical inquiry. I am not a trained historian, and I shall not examine the historical evidence for the Christian miracles. My effort is to put my readers in a position to do so. It is no use going to the texts until we have some idea about the possibility or probability of the miraculous. Those who assume that miracles cannot happen are merely wasting their time by looking into the texts. We know in advance what results they will find, for they have begun by begging the question. So people who, and that's the end of that very brief first chapter, people who, uh, who, enter into uh, this discussion uh, by going to the historical texts, which is what that author did, that author that uh, wrote that commentary Lewis was talking about, about the Gospel of John. People who enter into that discussion um, that have already settled in their minds that the supernatural uh, is not, it doesn't exist, either doesn't exist or doesn't affect the natural, uh, going to the historical texts for them is a useless policy. It's a useless practice uh, because they're going to, uh, and by going to the historical texts, he means going to the historical record about miracles. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a, there's stories of Christ healing a leper or walking on water or uh, making, uh, making uh, enough food to feed 5,000 people from a few loaves and a few fishes. These are, these are, stories of miracles, they would enter that discussion about any one of those particular miracles um, with a preconceived notion that miracles can't happen. So what must have really happened there? That's the way they start that story off for themselves. That's the way they start that investigation, rather, not that story. That's the way they start that investigation off for themselves. What must have really happened here? So, so you're saying he 
this author didn't do the research. He didn't read or, or... Well, if he did, he didn't communicate it to us. Mm. He didn't tell us how he came to that conclusion. He didn't tell us by what means he excludes the supernatural. Uh, what argument convinced him? He just assumes it from the outset. And this is why Lewis says we can't use historical inquiry as a way to to uh, sort of enrich this discussion because the real question, as Aristotle points out at the beginning of this chapter, is are we asking the right preliminary questions, the questions that start off the discussion, um, the questions that frame our way of looking at things. So let's go ahead and read the second chapter. We can start it out at least. I, I don't know how far we'll get, but okay. The second chapter is called The Naturalist and the Supernaturalist. And this is probably the most important. Uh, this and the next chapter are probably the most important chapters in this book. Um, they they set the terms um, and they uh, uh, frame the argument. They're probably, for that reason, also the most difficult chapters in this book. And it starts out with a quote also. <clears throat> the quote is, Gracious! exclaimed Miss Snip. And is there a place where people venture to live above ground? I never heard of a people living underground, replied Tim, before I came to Giant Land. Came to Giant Land? cried Miss Snip. Why, isn't everywhere Giant Land? That's a quote from, quote from a Roland Quiz uh, from a book called Giant Land. Lewis starts, I use the word miracle to mean an interference with nature by supernatural power. Now, he's got a footnote here that we should probably read. Um, the footnote is, This definition is not that which would be given by many theologians. I am adopting it not because I think it is it an improvement upon theirs, but precisely because being crude and popular, that's in quotes, it enables me most easily to treat those questions which the common reader, also in quotes, probably has in mind when he takes up a book on miracles. So he's directing that definition not at theologians who probably have a more nuanced or uh, more complicated definition for miracles, um, or maybe just a different definition for miracles. He's using that definition for miracles because that's the definition that most people who are reading this book would be concerned with. They would be concerned with miracles meaning an interference with nature by supernatural power. And he's, and uh, in the next sentences, the next paragraphs, he's going to define those terms. Mm -hmm. Lewis continues, unless there exists, in addition to nature, and nature is being scaled, uh, spelled with a capital N here, by the way, unless there exists, in addition to nature, something else, which we may call the supernatural, there can be no miracles. Some people believe that nothing exists except nature. I call these people naturalists. Okay, so we have a definition for our term, naturalist. The term naturalist means somebody who believes that nature is all there is. And he's going to define that more. Uh, probably, you know, we have an idea of what that might mean. Uh, nature uh, is all that exists. But probably that idea of uh, what, what uh, nature all that existing means is really limited. We probably haven't thought that out before. Um, so he's going to do a little bit of that for us. He goes on, others think that besides nature, there exists something else. I call them supernaturalists. Our first question, therefore, is whether the naturalists or the supernaturalists are right. And here comes our first difficulty. Before the naturalist and the supernaturalist can begin to discuss their differences of opinion, they must surely have an agreed definition both of nature and of supernature. And this is, and this is why I said that earlier. You, you may... It, you may have an idea in your head about when you say, well, if nature is all that exists and you begin to ponder what that might look like, you probably haven't thought that through very much. Uh, I haven't. Um, you know, you, you, have a, you have a vague idea of two different spaces existing, two different uh, uh, domains existing, and, and one of them you label nature and another one you label supernature. Uh, and and uh, um, does one exist? Well, you know nature exists, you live in it. Uh, does the other exist? That one's theoretical. Uh, and I, I don't know what images come to your mind, but I think of two, I think of two uh, uh, clear and very large beach balls. Uh, and inside one beach ball, uh, if we can get outside of it um, and take a total view of it, 
is all things that are in the in nature. So um, our world, uh, our galaxy, all galaxies, uh, all matter, time and space exist in that. And uh, that's uh, a visual that's completely unrealistic and um, uh, um, completely juvenile, but we're, we're uh, bound to think in space and time. We don't have any choice. So this is the one that comes to my mind. Uh, something else may come to yours, but in the other, uh, in the other, beside that very large beach ball with all the, with all of the, uh, um, all matter, space and time in it is another one. And what's inside that one, I don't have a real clear picture because I call that one supernature. Do they, uh, the question that he's going to discuss here is do they touch each other? Uh, whether they exist is one thing, and we're going to talk about that, but do they touch each other? In other words, can they interact? Okay. So I'll read that first sentence of this, uh, for this, this paragraph again. Before the naturalists and the supernaturalists can begin to discuss their difference of opinion, they must surely have an agreed definition both of nature and of supernature. But unfortunately, it is almost impossible to get such a definition. Just because the naturalist thinks that nothing but nature exists, the word nature means to him merely everything, or the whole show, or whatever there is. And if that is what we mean by nature, then of course nothing else exists. So if what the naturalist means by everything that there could possibly be, then we have a problem in our definitions. Uh, the supernaturalist will say that nature, he would limit nature. Right? He would limit nature and say it's only matter, time, space, um, and, uh, and all of the things that are naturally occurring. Uh, the, but there's another thing. Right? There's another thing that, that, that is outside of that, that definition. Uh, the naturalist would say, well, whatever it is that you say is outside of that definition, I also include in that definition. Right. So if you're saying there's something you call God or something you think about as God or something you think about as a force or a will out there that, that governs things or that makes things happen, I also include that in nature. Right? You're, I draw I draw the nature circle around that also. You're saying that that the that the naturalist is saying that what you call God is a product of it's part of it. Whatever so, it is, and you, you know, the naturalist would say you're wrong to call it God, or you're wrong to think that uh, that there's a force out there or a will. But whatever it is you're talking about, I also include that in nature. I draw that. I draw uh, my circle, the circle I call nature. I draw it around that also. Okay. So Lewis says, well, this is a problem, obviously. Um, um, and if he says, and if that is what we mean by nature, all things, whatever they might be then of course nothing else exists. If that's our definition, well, of course, there is nothing we would call supernature. The real question between him and the supernaturalists has evaded us. Some philosophers have defined nature as, quote, what we perceive with our five senses, end quote. But this also is unsatisfactory, for we do not perceive our own emotions in that way. You don't hear your happiness, right? You don't, you don't, you don't smell uh, your grief, your emotions aren't experienced by your five senses. Not in any way, really. You may experience the product of your emotions, right? You may cry if you're grieving, and so you hear that. Um, but you don't, but you don't perceive your the the emotion itself with your five senses. Mm. But this also is unsatisfactory, for we do not perceive our own emotions in that way, and yet they are presumably natural events natural is in quotation marks, in order to avoid this deadlock and to discover what the naturalist and the supernaturalist are really differing about, we must approach our problem in a more roundabout way. I begin by considering the following sentences. One, are those his natural teeth or a set? Two, the dog in his natural state is covered with fleas. Three, I love to get away from tilled lands and meddled roads and be alone with nature. 4. Do be natural. Why are you so affected? 5. It may have been wrong to kiss her, but it was very natural. Now one thing you see with these sentences is that this is being, these are being written by an Englishman. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> like do be natural. That's not something Americans say. But um, and why are you so affected? Uh, or why are you pretending? That's the way the British would, or or an educated British person or a guy from Oxford like a like a Lewis might say it. Yeah. So those are things that come through. How but would the other the Americans say, it? Uh, <laughs> uh, "Be real, man. <laughs> why, why, why are you pretending?" Right. That's that's how American might say it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah. So the other thing that jumps out about these sentences is that they all use in one way or another the word nature or a word related to nature, like natural. They all use that word, but they're all using it in a different way, right? Slightly different way. Uh, there's a common thread, though, and that's actually what the next uh, sentence, those are the words the next sentence begins with. A common thread of meaning in all these usages can easily be discovered, Lewis says. The natural teeth, in the first sentence, the natural teeth are those which grow in the mouth. We do not have to design them, make them, or fit them. Because the first sentence was, are those his natural teeth or a set? So what do we mean by that? Are they fake? Are they artificial? Hmm. Or are they the ones that would happen without us intervening at all? In other words, the ones that grow in your mouth. In the second sentence, the dog's natural state, because the second sentence was the dog in his natural state is covered with fleas. The dog's natural state is the one he will be in if no one takes soap and water and prevents it. If no one domesticates the dog. The countryside, where nature reigns supreme, is the one where soil, weather, and vegetation produce their results unhelped and unimpeded by man. A third sentence there was, I love to get away from tilled lands and meddled roads and be alone with nature. Well, what does he mean by it? What do we mean by be alone with nature? We mean the place where man's designs and buildings and... Uh, where his footprints aren't. Right, where there's no footprint of man, uh, where things are occurring on their own. Natural behavior, the fourth sentence there, do be natural. Why are you so affected? Natural behavior is the behavior which people would exhibit if they were not at pains to alter it. In other words, if they were being their real selves, right? If they weren't pretending, if they weren't, uh, to use a more colloquial phrase, if they weren't putting on a front. The natural kiss in the fifth sentence, it may have been wrong to kiss her, but it was very natural. The natural kiss is the kiss which will be given if moral or prudential considerations do not intervene. Prudential there meaning wisdom, right? It may have, uh, there, there are situations where it's not wise to kiss the girl. It may not. It may not have been right to do it. Uh, the sentence says it may have been wrong to kiss her, but it was so very natural. It was very natural to do it. I, I, I was. I was compelled to do it. Hmm. In all the examples, nature means what happens, quote, of itself, end quote, or quote, of its own accord, end quote. What you do not need to labor for, what you will get if you take no measures to stop it. Those are important definitions for nature there because they really frame how we talk about nature in the rest of this book. Let's read those again. In all the examples, nature means what happens of itself or of its own accord. What you do not need to labor for. What do we need to labor for? You need to labor for your... At some point, you, you sitting here uh, holding this book are a massive product of a tremendous amount of human labor. Your clothes... Uh, the microphone in front of your 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 mouth, the book you're uh, holding, the chair you're sitting on, the shoes you're wearing, the building you're in, all of these things, the the <laughs> the heat coming through the the uh, the vent to keep us warm, all of these things are a product of massive amounts of labor. Labor you'll never actually encounter because you won't meet the people that did it. But you are a huge product of labor, and um, um, all of these things had to be labored for. They had to be carved out of nature, modified. Um, tinkered with, designed. That's not what he means by nature. Nature is is a situation where none of that has happened. No tinkering, uh, no no twisting, no no modifying. Um, he says it's what you do not have to labor for, or what you do not need to labor for. What you will get if you take no measures to stop it, like the dog with the fleas. The dog would be covered in fleas in its natural state, if we left it alone, that is, if we didn't domesticate it, if we didn't 
bathe it and trim it and feed it and deworm it and deflee it and things like that. He goes on, the Greek word for nature, physis, is connected with the Greek verb for to grow. That's where we get our word physics, by the way. Latin, uh, Latin natura with the verb to be born. So the Greek version of, of nature is physis and the Latin version is natura. Probably pronouncing both of those wrong, but there, uh, the Greek verb, the Greek verb is means to grow, and the Latin verb means to be born, which are very much connected to each other. To grow and to be born. The natural is what springs up, Lewis says, or comes forth, or arrives, or goes on of its own accord. He puts emphasis on that especially of its own accord. The na the natural is the given, what is there already, the spontaneous the unintended, the unsolicited. The unintended is important too. There's no design to it, right? I, if someone intended to make the shoes you're wearing. It was their design to do it. The natural is what happens when there is no design at all. Uh, when events are occurring um, without any outside or with, without any designed influence. What the naturalist believes is that the ultimate fact, and that's spelled with a capital F there, what the naturalist believes is that the ultimate fact, the thing you can't go behind, is a vast process in space and time, which is going on of its own accord. So the naturalist thinks that um, the ultimate base of reality, uh, the ultimate fact, the, the, um, the reason, in other words, that all things are going on, is that the natural process. It's undesigned, it's unsolicited, it's unintended. It's, it's going on, as he emphasized, of its own accord. There's no design to it. It is merely occurring. So he's defining here how, what the naturalist thinks. Inside that total system, every particular event, such as you're sitting reading this book, happens because some other event has happened. In the long run, because the total event is happening. Total event there is capital T, capital E. So the only reason that any event is occurring, and this is where we sort of get into the weeds here in this book, where things uh, get difficult. This is, Miracles is, uh, by many people, is considered Lewis's most difficult book to read because he's handling a difficult subject. And the most difficult subject in this difficult book is the question of of uh, determinism. That's what he's going to handle here. He's going to handle, and we'll talk about what determinism means, but he's going to handle um, the inherently deterministic elements of the naturalist, right? of, of what the naturalist believes, rather. So I'll read that sentence again. Inside that total system, the total system the naturalists, the naturalist believes exists, inside that total system, Every particular event happens because some other event has happened. In other words, there's a cause, uh, a sequence of causes that result in you sitting here reading this book with me. In the long run, all those events are happening because the total event is happening. The total event there being spelled with capital T, capital E. The reason, the fact, that fact we spelled with a capital F earlier, those, uh, all of these other subsequent events, these, these, uh, what might seem minor events, are happening because the total event is happening. Reality is happening. The uh, cause and effect is happening. Each particular thing, such as this page, is what it is because other things are what they are. And so eventually, because the whole system is what it is. Now that sounds like, circu those sound like circular definitions, um, but that's exactly what the naturalists would say. All the things that you see, all the items that come into your vision, all the, all the matter that's presented to your senses, all the beliefs that you have, all of the ideas that occur in your mind, um, all of these things are a product of the total system. They are, they are occurring because, um, because other events are occurring, right? That, that, that sounds like a really silly definition, but if you think about it, it, it it's, it's, uh, it's actually how we, um, most of us, uh, frame reality, like uh, why does the sun come up? Well, if we traced back the events that produced uh, why the sun is rising or why we perceive it to rise, um, 
we would have to say that the sun is rising because a whole bunch of other events are occurring or have already occurred, mm. right? Why, uh, why uh, does, uh, well, your dog have puppies tomorrow? Uh, well, it's in the long run, taking the long view of history, and there we're talking about millions or even billions of years, the dog is having puppies because a whole bunch of other events have occurred. Right. So it's not, it's, there's a, uh, a word, uh, uh, kind of a difficult word, a tautology. A tautology is something that's so, uh, so obvious, such an obvious definition that it almost doesn't need to be said. Uh, and that's, that's what we might say about something like this. It's so obvious that it's a tautology. And when we do actually say it, when we do actually say this definition, it sounds a little bit, um, it sounds a little bit like we're trying to evade the question. Well, why is this event occurring? Well, because all the other events have occurred. That sounds like a little bit like you're trying to evade the question, but that is exactly what the naturalist would, would say if the naturalist had thought these things through. Every event is occurring because in the long run, all events are occurring. Okay, so there was my very sloppy attempt to, to explain that. So all the things and events are so completely interlocked that no one of them can claim the slightest independence from the whole show. Every event is part of all other events. None of them exists on its own or goes on of its own accord, except in the sense that it exhibits at some particular place and time that general existence on its own or behavior on it, uh, of its own accord, which belongs to nature, the great interlocked event as a whole. So any event that might at first seem to be an independent event, um, uh, us having this conversation, for example, in the long run, uh, if we thought about it uh, enough, if we took in enough information, if we considered enough factors, enough variables, would, in the naturalist position, be uh, it would tell uh, it would tell us that uh, that this event, us reading this book, us having this conversation. It's is merely one more domino. One more domino, exactly. It, well, very well put. It's one more domino in a series of dominoes that have been falling for billions of years. Uh, and you can you can kind of get a sense of where this is going here with what this would mean for things like free will, right? Things like an independent thought in your head. And Lewis handles that uh, next. Thus. No thoroughgoing naturalist believes in free will. <laughs> so no thoroughgoing naturalist. What does he mean by thoroughgoing? He means somebody who's really committed to being a naturalist. Somebody who, who has thought it through, understands it, and maintains it, digs in his heels as a naturalist. No thoroughgoing naturalist can believe in free will. For free will, Lewis continues, would mean that human beings have the power of independent action. Independent of what? the total show, all of nature, all of the interlocked events that we might label existence or being. Uh, none of our, uh, none of, no action that we could possibly commit, no matter how much we might feel it's independent, could possibly be independent. And they're so not, they're not our own. They're not our own. And so we never are exercising, uh, no thoroughgoing naturalist could believe, as Lewis says, that free will exists in that system. Thus, no thoroughgoing naturalist believes in free will, for free will would mean that human beings have the power of independent action, the power of doing something more or other than what was involved by the total series of events. And any such separate power of originating events is what the naturalist denies. The naturalist denies that any, any ability to do something outside of the natural process is possible. Right? That's what the naturalist is denying, because that is effectively what the supernatural is. The supernaturalist claims that there is something outside of the natural process, and it is going on, and it can affect the natural process. Right? Mm -hmm. Outside of the natural process is governance. Outside of the natural process is ability to, to dictate what's going on. Spontaneity, originality, action on its own is a privilege reserved for the whole show, Lewis puts that in quotation marks, which he calls nature. So only nature has the ability to produce independent action. He thinks that things fall into two classes, 
In the first class, we find either things, or more probably one thing, which is basic and original, which exists on its own. So, you know, we he's, he's kind of defined the terms of what he thinks a naturalist is, and now he's doing that for the supernaturalist. Um, supernaturalist and the naturalist both agree that there is something that exists on its own, uh, something that is capable of independent action. For the naturalist, the thing that's capable of independent action is nature itself, all of it. Now, not the particular things inside of it, like you and me and the ant and uh, an atom or a subatomic particle, but but the show, the whole thing itself in totality is capable of independent action, is capable of doing something on its own. The supernaturalist agrees that there is something that happens on its own. Um, it's just outside. Right. It's outside of nature. It's outside of that natural process. And that's what he's trying to distinguish here. Um, he says that the supernaturalist uh, does not identify this fact with the whole show. You notice that fact is capitalized there. He thinks that things fall into two classes. In the first class, we find either things or more probably one thing, which is also capitalized there which is basic and original, which exists on its own. In the second, the second class, we find things which are merely derivative from that one thing. One thing there is obviously meaning uh, um, God in Lewis's, um, in Lewis's uh, uh, thinking. So the supernaturalist has uh, things like, uh, has a picture in his mind kind of like the one I described earlier. Two beach balls, right? In one is nature uh, all of the all of the uh, material things uh, like uh, galaxies and planets and and two guys um, talking into a microphone and posting to YouTube all those things are in that uh, that beach ball in my thinking in my uh, in my picture of uh, of these distinct classes and in the other one is the um, uh, the supernatural right in that other clear giant enormous beach ball is the supernatural and uh, the things in the natural are derivative of the things in the supernatural they come from it that's what derivative means there where was i here okay okay <clears throat> here it is the one basic thing has caused all the other things to be it exists on its own they exist because it exists. They will cease to exist if it ever ceases to maintain them in existence. They will be altered if it ever alters them. The difference between the two views might be expressed by saying that naturalism gives us a democratic, supernatural, supernaturalism, a monarchical picture of reality. So, in, in, uh, uh, and he's using, Lewis is using political systems there to, to kind of, uh, help help us imagine what this looks like in um, uh, in a naturalist from a naturalist perspective. Everything is uh, um, uh, all of the events in the system contribute to the totality of the system, right? And they are um, um, none of them are independent of the others. That's where the uh, that's why he calls it a democratic, democratic. system there. Oh, okay, uh, and in the supernaturalist system, everything in the uh, in nature is dependent on one central fact. Mm -hmm. uh, it's derived from and depends on one central fact. Uh, that's why he refers to it as a monarchical uh, system. Uh, monarchical being a king or uh, an emperor or a, a queen that that uh, gives orders to everything else. Uh, depends on everything else depends on the the will and and uh, beneficence of the king the difference between the two views might be expressed by saying that naturalism gives us a democratic supernaturalism a monar monarchical picture of reality the naturalist thinks that the privilege of being on its own resides in the total mass of things just as in a democracy sovereignty resides in the whole mass of the people the supernaturalist thinks that this privilege belongs to some things, or more probably one thing, and not to others. Just as in a real monarchy, the king has sovereignty and the people have not. And just as in a democracy all citizens are equal, so for the naturalist, one thing or event is as good as another. 
in the sense that they are equally dependent on the total system of things. There's no difference uh, for the naturalist uh, if he's a thoroughgoing naturalist. And that's what we're going to be talking about throughout the whole book. When he talks about a naturalist, he's talking about a thoroughgoing naturalist, not somebody who's just a casual, God doesn't exist kind of a person. Uh, he's talking about somebody who has genu genuinely thought through these issues and uh, understands their implications. Okay, so... Uh, and he says there that a naturalist is, is uh, for what for the naturalist, one event is as good as another uh, because um, they, they are equally, equally, I don't want to say equally, I guess the equally meaningless is, is one way to put it, but uh, equally um, uh, indistinguishable is another way to put it. They're equally indistinguishable from, from each other. So, um, and in that in that way, they they parallel a democracy where all citizens are equal to each other in theory, and and uh, in a, in a monarchy, one thing is more important than all other things: the king. Indeed, each of them is only the way. Excuse me. Indeed, each of them is only the way in which the character of that total system exhibits itself at a particular point in space and time. The supernaturalist, on the other hand, believes that the one original or self-existent thing is on a different level from, and more important than, all other things. At this point, a suspicion may occur that supernaturalism first arose from reading into the universe the structure of monarchical societies, but then, of course, it may, with equal reason, be suspected that naturalism has arisen from reading into it the structure of modern democracies. Okay, so maybe he says, and he just kind of handled this briefly, maybe he, he says that uh, uh, people thought that God existed in the past because that that mirrored the kind of political structures that they had back then. They had kings, they had queens. So of course they'd look at the universe and say, well, it has a king, it has a queen. But uh, also the opposite might be true. But also, if, if that's true, then the opposite might be true. Perhaps in the era of democracies, we've done that. We've also done that. We've read into the structure of the universe, the political realities into which we were born. Right. So, as he says here, the two suspicions thus cancel out and give us no help in deciding which theory is more likely to be true. That may be true that people read into the, the universe those idea, uh, those uh, hierarchies, those ways of looking uh, at authority and and structure uh, because of the system they were born into, because of the political system they were born into. Uh, but we may have done that also, <laughs> and therefore those two ideas cancel each other out. They don't help us get closer to the truth. They do indeed remind us that supernaturalism is the characteristic philosophy of a monarchical, monarchical age and naturalism of a democratic, in the sense that supernaturalism, even if false, would have been believed by the great mass of unthinking people 400 years ago, just as naturalism, even if false, will be believed by the great mass of unthinking people today. So Lewis continues on, the supernaturalist agrees with the naturalist that there must be something which exists in its own right, some basic fact whose existence it would be nonsensical to try to explain, because this fact is itself the ground or starting point of all explanations. But he does not identify this fact with the whole show. Because there was a time in the past when we did have monarchical structures, right? We had kings, we had queens, we had emperors. Uh, we had uh, we had aristocracies, people born into power, and the people had no sovereignty at all. The great mass of people, uh, so they looked. Uh, even if even if uh, um, they would, those people back then, even if it was false, would have looked at the universe and thought about it as a supernaturalistic um, um, event or a, a supernaturalistic setting that there was a king that governed, a king-like being or a king-like authority that governed the universe, right? Mm -hmm. They would have read that into it, even if it was false. But we might equally read into the universe that it's a democratic uh, uh, universe, that all things are really equal and no thing is more important than another, even if that was false. <clears throat> we'll continue reading here. He says, everyone will have seen that the one self-existent thing, and all three of those words are capitalized there, or the small class of self-existent things in which supernaturalists believe is what we call God or the gods. I propose for the rest of this book to treat only that form of supernaturalism which believes in one God, partly because polytheism is not likely to be a live issue for most of my readers, and partly because those who believed in many gods very seldom, in fact, regarded their gods as creators of the universe and self-existent. 
The gods of Greece were not really supernatural in the strict sense which I am giving to the word. They were products of the total system of things and included within it. This introduces an important distinction. So from this point on, he's not going to talk about, um, uh, as he put it there, a small class of self-existent things at the beginning of that paragraph. Those are the gods, small g and plural. Uh, he's not going to refer to those anymore. From now on, when he talks about the one thing or the one self-existent thing, he's talking about a singular god, a monotheistic god, to use a theological term. So, uh, you know, partly he's saying, well, most people that I'm, are, are going to read my book aren't concerned with polytheism. They're not polytheists. And even if they were, um, almost none of the polytheistic systems in the past, the systems that had multiple gods, had a god who was the creator of the gods were not the creators of the universe. They were products of it. They were part of it. Mm. Um, uh, that part where he says, uh, uh, the gods of Greece were not really supernatural in the strict sense, which I am giving to the word. Um, what does he mean by, uh, in the strict sense? And well, remember he says his, the word, does he mean the Bible? No, no. Remember the, remember the definition he gave for supernaturalism earlier. The supernaturalism oh. he's talking about is is a um, uh, the the definition kind of kind of goes along with the definition for miracle that he gave at the very beginning of the chapter. He said, "I at the beginning of the chapter, he said, I use the word miracle to mean an interference with nature by supernatural power." Okay, so something that has to enter from outside the natural process and affect the natural process. Mm. The gods, the gods of Greece, were not like that. They were really little better than very powerful men and women. Uh, they, um, to say nothing of their, their, uh, moral flaws, which they had many, uh, of which they had many, they, uh, they were also fallible. Uh, they were also, um, subject to being destroyed. Uh, they were subject to dying even. Um, they were, they were influenced and affected by the natural universe itself. So and he said, in, he, what he's saying is in the strict sense that I'm giving to the term supernatural, they were not supernatural beings. They were just very powerful beings that lived in nature. Gotcha. Okay. Now, he says this introduces an important distinction. The difference between naturalism and supernaturalism is not exactly the same as the difference between belief in a god and disbelief. Naturalism, without ceasing to be itself, could admit a certain kind of god. The great interlocking event called nature might be such as to produce at some stage a great cosmic consciousness, an indwelling god arising from the whole process as human mind arises, according to the naturalists, from human organisms. A naturalist would not object to that sort of God. The reason is this, such a God would not stand outside nature or the total system, would not be existing on his own. It would still be the whole show, which was the basic fact, and such a God would merely be one of the things, even if he were the most interesting, which the basic fact contained. What naturalism cannot accept is the idea of a god who stands outside nature and made it. So he's saying here that naturalism could admit something like the Greek gods. It could allow for that because it those born within because it was born within the system. Mm-hmm. Right. It's part of the whole show. It's still it's, contained within the beach ball. Exactly. And that's the thing the naturalist is really uh, uh, at odds with. That's the thing the naturalist is really um, contending with. It's something existing on its own independence from the total show this is what this is what uh, ruffles his fe- his feathers so um he, he even kind of alludes to sort of uh what some people might call a pantheistic god right uh, a god that is um that is uh, uh how did he put it that's uh, uh the great interlocking event called nature might be such as to produce at some stage, a great cosmic consciousness, a sort of a pantheistic God, where God is sort of everything, right? Everything is God, and everything sort of vibrates in such a way that it produces a, a cosmic consciousness, as he puts here. And um, um, this is this is a God that that even a naturalist a naturalist might admit. Now, most naturalists probably wouldn't admit that, but if they were going to, they wouldn't have a problem admitting that one because that's one that doesn't that doesn't uh, stand outside of the natural processes. Mm-hmm. We are now in a position to state the difference between the naturalist and the supernaturalist, despite the fact that they do not mean the same by the word nature. The naturalist believes that a great process of becoming 
exists on its own in space and time and that nothing else exists. What we call particular things and events being only the parts into which we analyze the great process or the shapes which that process takes at given moments and given points in space. This single total reality he calls nature. The supernaturalist believes that one thing, capital T, exists on its own and has produced the framework of space and time and the procession of systematically connected events which fill them. This framework and this filling he calls nature. It may or may not be the only reality which the one primary thing has produced. There may be other systems in addition to the one we call nature. So there's the distinction, right? The naturalist believes that all of the things that we observe and see, uh, that we experience, are um, uh, part of a system or part of a process that is becoming. It's evolving. It's changing. Um, but it's not changing with any independent action inside of it. It's changing because all events are interconnected, interlocked in a way that they can't escape. Okay, that's why he says becoming. Uh, <clears throat> the supernaturalist uh, um, think that, thinks that there's one thing that exists and everything else comes from that one thing. Uh, it's one thing that exists on its own, and he capitalizes that, that word thing here uh, to indicate that he's talking about uh, God or something like God. Uh, one thing exists and everything else depends on that thing. Um, and this is the real distinction between them, right? That, uh, that, uh, um, um, that they draw a distinction. They separate two, uh, the two things. Supernaturalists might even say that nature, this particular nature, is just one nature that this thing made. And this thing could have made other natures, right? And there, here again, the beach ball image comes to my mind because... You know, we've got this giant beach ball and it contains all the things that, that are that are material in my mind. You're, you're following me through my imaginary thinking here now. But maybe there's other <laughs> beach balls that have other natures in them uh, subject to their own natural rules. We have our natural rules here, uh, uh, gravity, electromagnetism, so uh, weak, um, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the four basic forces in the in the universe. And maybe there are other universes that have different rules, uh, different patterns. Uh, and so, you know, the supernaturalist could even think that. He could even admit that perhaps there are other natures. This is just one of many. It could be. doesn't mean, uh, that's, that's just a, uh, an issue for speculation, but, but he mentions that as, as, a, as a possibility that, that the supernaturalist could believe in many natures if he wanted to. In that sense, getting back to Lewis here, in that sense, there might be several natures. This conception must be kept quite distinct from what is commonly called plurality of worlds, i.e. different solar systems or different galaxies, island universe ex universes existing in widely separated parts of a single space and time. These, however remote, would be parts of the same nature as our own sun, and <clears throat> it and they would be interlocked by being in relations to one another, spatial and temporal relations, and casual relations uh, also. And it is just this reciprocal interlocking within a system which makes it what we call a nature. Other natures might not be spatio-temporal at all, or, if any of them were, their space and time would have no spatial or temporal relations to our own. It is just this discontinuity, this failure of interlocking, which would justify us in calling them different natures. Now, this might seem like, like what, why, is Lewis, why is Lewis carrying on about this? Okay, uh, Plurality of worlds, he has that in quotation marks, is the idea that there are uh, other habitable places to live, other habitable planets, right? But that's whether not... Whether it be from, whether it be in this universe or another. Right, but it, it, in the idea of plurality of worlds, the, the, multiple, uh, the multiple possible habitable planets are still within this nature, right? They're, they're, uh, they may be in different solar systems, but that doesn't mean they're not in the same nature, affected by the same rules that govern this planet. The government this with your beach ball uh, example. They'd all be in the same. They'd beach all ball. be in the same beach ball. Correct. Correct. Gotcha. So, um, what he's talking about here is is uh, when he says talks about different natures, he's talking about um, different beach balls, <laughs> different beach balls where where um, um, perhaps there are even different rules that govern them, um, and. He says, you know, this is, this is, it's this discontinuity that we're really interested in here. Discontinuity means 
uh, that the rules in one beach ball don't affect the rules in the other. Uh, they don't talk. They don't. Uh, they don't uh, cross over each other. They don't. They don't overlap each other in any way. There's no exchange between the There's two no beach balls. Interlocking. They're not interlocking at all. Right. One event that occurs in this beach ball does not affect an event that occurs in this beach ball. They are independent of each other. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's this. It's this discontinuity uh, that that he's interested in here. I I uh, I I wonder what. And I might be getting ahead of myself, but what is an interlocking between a spiritual, between uh, a spiritual uh, world and the natural world? Well, world? that's what he's talking. That's what he uh, hopes to get to in this oh, book. Okay, I see. Uh, the in fact, that's why he's discussing this because <clears throat> um, you can see in the very you can see in the very next sentence that he alludes to that. So we'll go back one previous sentence and read it is just this discontinuity this failure of interlocking which would justify us in calling them different natures this does not mean that there would be absolutely no relation between them this is getting to what you were talking about they would be related by their common derivation from a single supernatural source so the two beach balls uh to keep with that image um if they were made created they would uh, be related by the fact that they both came from the same creator and he uses an analogy here in just a minute to talk about uh, an author could write two different novels and the characters in them could have absolutely no relation to each other but they would be related in one way that's that they came from the same author they would in this respect be like different novels by a single author the events in one story have no relation to the events in another except that they are invented by the same author To find the relation between them, you must go right back to the author's mind. There is no cutting across anything Mr. Pickwick says in Pickwick Papers to anything Miss Gamp says in Martin Chuzzlewit. These are two novels by Charles Dickens. Similarly, there would be no normal cutting across from an event in one nature to an event in any other. By a normal relation, I mean one which occurs in virtue of the character of the two systems. We have to put in the qualification, normal, because we do not know in advance that God might not bring two natures into partial contact at some particular point. That is, he might allow selected events in one, in the one to produce results in the other. There would thus be at, at a certain point, excuse me, there would thus be at certain points a partial interlocking, but this would not turn the two natures into one, for the total re- reciprocity which makes a nature would still be lacking, and the anomalous interlockings would arise not from what either system was in itself, but from the divine act which was bringing them together, and this gets to, this 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 is a complicated sentence, but it gets to the heart of what this book is about. Okay, because um, let's say that there were two independent beach balls with two independent natures in them. One's governed by one set of rules. One's governed by another set of rules, um, and uh, and they don't they don't connect at all. They don't they don't exchange anything at all. There's no trade between them if you want to look at it economically. <laughs> they they. Uh, uh, they're distinct completely. Now, um, let's say that they are that they are both made by the same uh, maker, uh, creator. Uh, that it is conceivable that that creator could allow those two things to 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 uh, um, exchange something, exchange some event, right? But the exchanging of that event would not mean that they are now related to each other in the way that uh my existence is related to yours mm-hmm. uh, my existence affects yours whether you like it or not and yours affects me in fact uh everything in the universe affects your existence in one way or another uh maybe an extremely small way but it affects your existence and that's the kind of reciprocity that he's talking about there reciprocity uh meaning that give and take that that uh, our existences have my existence has a given has a uh, a certain take and a certain give with yours and yours has a certain give and a certain take with mine. Mm-hmm. And you have a certain give and take with all things in existence, however small that give and take might be. There is a reciprocity between you and all material things. Now, it's a really strange thing to think about, uh, you know, to cut you off for a second. So two beach balls, two natural uh, um, systems, systems, I mean, would the wouldn't the naturalists argue that there's one show? Yes, they would. But one, yes, they would. But what he's saying here is, you a supernaturalist could admit, uh, could allow for multiple 
uh, natures to exist that don't have any connection to each other. Their only connection being to uh, back to the uh, original author or the original creator, right, of those two systems. Uh, they the sure. naturalists would say that there's only one system that governs those. Yes. So, um, uh, several beach balls within the beach ball. All right. So now we're talking spatially. I'm right? sorry. Just, no, 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 no. It's 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 a it's important to talk about because I, I'm trying to get myself to a place where yeah, I yeah, don't okay. leave. If I'm in their shoes, in a naturalist's okay. shoes, I don't leave the the beach ball. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. So so. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to get into, uh, into the weeds a little bit here, uh, with, and you know, I, my knowledge of physics is, is far Do too shallow best. to really get to, to really get too deep in. But, uh, what we're talking about here are multiple universes. Okay. It's another idea, I guess, that, that could go under the heading plurality of worlds, which Lewis already mentioned. Right. So there is a theory out there, which I am, uh, no, in no way qualified to explain that that there are uh, multiple universes. When we say universe, we mean that beach ball, okay? There are multiple universes. And in these multiple universes, uh, the, the, the settings of nature are different, right? Uh, if, you, if, you tweaked, if you tweaked even one of the, the uh, um, four forces I mentioned a moment ago, gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nu nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force, if you tweak them even a little bit, existence uh, would look far, far different. If, if there would even have, uh, and life may not even be possible in some of these, if, if we tweak these just a little bit. So we can imagine universes where those rules are slightly tweaked, whether even the same forces are at play, those four forces I named, but they're slightly different in how much each one um, affects the other, right? That would drastically change uh, the, the landscape that we're, that we're looking at. And this is talked about a lot. In fact, it's, it's, as I understand things again, it's possible, it's likely that this is what's going on, that there are multiple universes. Okay. So what you are saying is if there are multiple universes, wouldn't they also then be contained inside just a larger container, right? <laughs> Cause we're, we think spatially, right? We don't have a choice. We, we, this is a, this is the, uh, the handcuffs that our minds are in to, to, to think spatially and temporally. Yeah. That really is the question. Uh, as far as I understand it, that is one of the primary questions uh, discussed at, uh, uh, among physicists is how uh, are those things, are those universes in some way related? In other words, do they, do they exist on a common plane? And even though their rules are different, is there some relation between them? right? Mm. Maybe we don't understand what that relation is, but is there some relation between them? In a way, they're asking the same question we're asking here, which is these two beach balls, to get back to our, our, our uh, sort of juvenile um, uh, um, illustration, their rules are different, drastically different, but their author could be the same. That would be the larger beach ball that they're both in that you're trying that, that you see. that you try to introduce there okay it, it are we getting at what you're talking about yes yes okay. um it's a little it's a little uh i don't want to say tough uh tough to hear i mean um do i lose uh uniqueness you know given the possibility of all these uh uh, universes that may or may not contain uh, life uh, in God's eyes. Do I, well. Let, uh, let let let's save that because that actually is talked about a great deal later on in, in later chapters. So let's okay. just save that. Yeah. Okay. Um. That's a that's that's a pertinent question, and he handles it. So let's just save that. Okay. If this, uh, getting back to Lewis here, if this occurred, each of the two natures would be supernatural in relation to, to the other because they'd be interacting, right? There, there'd be some exchange between them. But the fact of their contact would be supernatural in a more absolute sense, not as being beyond this or that nature, but beyond any and every nature. It would be one kind of miracle. The other kind would be divine interference, not by the bringing together of the natures, but simply. Divine interference being God intervening from outside the natural processes. All this is at present purely speculative. 
It by no means follows from supernaturalism that miracles of any sort do in fact occur. God, the primary thing, may never in fact interfere with the natural system he has created. If he has created more natural systems than one, he may never cause them to impinge on one another. But that is a question for further consideration. If we decide that nature is not the only thing there is, then we cannot say in advance whether she is safe from miracles or not. There are things outside her. We do not yet know whether they can get in. The gates may be barred, or they may not. But if naturalism is true, then we do know, excuse me, then we do know in advance that miracles are impossible. Nothing can come into nature from the outside because there is nothing outside to come in, nature being everything. No doubt events which we in our ignorance should mistake for miracles might occur, but they would in reality be just they would in reality be just like the commonest events, an inevitable result of the character of the whole system. Our first choice, therefore, must be between naturalism and supernaturalism. Now, it's He's sort of he's setting the stage here for the next chapter, and the next chapter. Uh, so, what he's going to talk about in the next chapter is to say, well, if if there is something beyond nature, we don't know. Uh, if if there is something outside of the natural processes, we have absolutely no way of saying for sure that it can't enter in and change something inside the natural processes. It can't change nature itself. In other words, we have no security against miracles in that situation. Uh, we're, we have no way to say for sure that miracles cannot happen. But if the naturalist is right, and nature is all there exists, then for sure, miracles cannot happen. For sure, because this is all that there is. And there would be, there might be events that we would mistake for miraculous events, like, like the football play that might, that shouldn't have happened, uh, or is just too unbelievable to have happened, or the car wreck that you avoided yesterday. Um, that uh, you would mistake, you might mistake those things for miracles, but if you had enough information and if you understood the situation uh, and all, in all of its detail, you would know that those were just natural events that were just more complicated than you could understand at the moment. So if the naturalist is right and nature is all there is, then miracles don't occur for sure. The question then, and this is the right preliminary questions that Aristotle starts this this, uh, this chapter out with, is, is naturalism right or is supernaturalism right? So we've defined the terms naturalist, supernaturalist. Now we have to decide, uh, or uh, Lewis has to say, which one is right? Is the naturalist right or is the supernaturalist right? That's the first preliminary question. You remember he brought up the commentary that he was reading about the Gospel of John. And now the author said that the Gospel of John must have been written after the death of Peter because Christ predicts it. Mm -hmm. Well, he's assuming there that miracles can occur, yeah. that the supernatural cannot influence the natural. Um, he's doing something in philosophy that they call begging the question. The very question is, can miracles occur? If you start out saying they can't, you've answered the question before we've even begun to explore it. Mm. That's called begging the question. And that's exactly what that author of that commentary has done. He's begged the question. Lewis proposes that we don't beg the question, that we explore the question and say, is the naturalist or the supernaturalist right? So that'll be chapter three. And we'll start that next time.